Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret? Blind Man's Buff by H.R. Wakefield Well, Thank heavens that yokel seemed to know the place, said Mr. Court to himself. First to the right, second to the left, black gates. I hope the oaf in Wendover who sent me six miles out of my way will freeze to death. It's not often like this in England, cold as the penny in a dead man's eye. He'd barely reached the place before dusk. He let the car out over the rasping frozen roads. First to the right must be this. Second to the left must be this. And there were the black gates. He got out, swung them open, and drove cautiously up a narrow, twisting drive, his headlights peering suspiciously round the bends. Those hedges wanted clipping, he thought, and this lane would have to be remetalled, full of holes. Nasty drive up on a bad night. It would cost some money, though. The car began to climb steeply and swing to the right, and presently the high hedges ended abruptly and Mr. Court pulled up in front of Lawn Manor. He got out of the car, rubbed his hands, stamped his feet, and looked about him. Lawn Manor was embedded halfway up a Chilton Spur, and, as the agent had observed, commanded extensive vistas. The place looked its age, Mr. Court decided, or rather ages, for the double Georgian brick chimneys ward of the Queen Anne left front. He could just make out the date... 1703, at the base of the nearest chimney. All that wing must have been added later. Big place, marvellous bargain at 7,000, can't understand it. How those windows with their little curved eyebrows seem to frown down on one. And then he turned and examined the vistas. The trees were tinted exquisitely to an uncertain glory as the great red sinking sun flashed its rays on their crystal mantle. The veil of Aylesbury was drowsing beneath a slowly deepening shroud of mist. Above it, the hills, the crests rounded and shaded by silver and rose coppices, seemed to have set in them great smoky eyes of flame, where the last rays burned in them. It's like some dream world, thought Mr. Court. It's curious how, wherever the sun strikes it, it seems to make an eye, and each one fixed on me. Those hills even those windows. But, judging from that mist, I shall have a slow journey home. I'd better have a quick look inside, though I've already taken a prejudice against the place. I hardly know why. Too lonely and isolated, perhaps. And then the eyes blinked and closed, and it was dark. He took a key from his pocket and went up three steps and thrust it into the keyhole of the massive oak door. The next moment he looked forward into absolute blackness, and the door swung to and closed behind him. This, of course, must be the palatial panelled hall which the agent described. He must strike a match and find the light switch. He fumbled in his pockets without success, and then he went through them again. He thought for a moment. I must have left them on the seat in the car, he decided. I'll go and fetch them. The door must be just behind me here. He turned and groped his way back, and then drew himself up sharply, for it had seemed that something had slipped past him. And then he put out his hands to touch the back of a chair, brocaded, he judged. He moved to the left of it and walked into a wall, changed his direction, went back past the chair, and found the wall again. He went back to the chair, sat down, and went through his pockets again, more thoroughly and carefully this time. Well, there was nothing to get fussed about. He was bound to find a door sooner or later. Now, let him think. When he came in, he had gone straight forward, three yards perhaps, but he couldn't have gone straight back because he'd stumbled into this chair. The door must be a little to the left, or the right of it. He'd try each in turn. He turned to the left first and found himself going down a little narrow passage. He could feel its sides when he stretched out his hands. Well, then, he tried to the right. He did so, and walked into a wall. He groped his way along it, and again it seemed as if something slipped past him. I wonder if there's a bat in here, he asked himself. 
and then found himself back at the chair. How Rachel would laugh if she could see him now. Surely he had a stray match somewhere. He took off his overcoat and ran his hands round the seam of every pocket, and then he did the same to the coat and waistcoat of his suit. And then he put them on again. Well, he'd try again. He'd follow the wall along. He did so and found himself in a little narrow passage. Suddenly he shot out his right hand, for he had the impression that something had brushed his face, very lightly. I'm beginning to get a little bored with that bat and this blasted room generally, he said to himself. I could imagine a more nervous person than myself getting a little fussed and panicky, but that's the one thing not to do. Ah, here was that chair again. Now I'll try the wall on the other side. Well, that seemed to go on forever. So he retraced his steps till he found the chair and sat down again. He whistled a little snatch resignedly. What an echo! The little tune had been flung back at him so fiercely, almost menacingly. Menacingly? That was just a feeble panicky word a nervous person would use. Well, he'd go to the left again this time. As he got up, a quick spurt of cold air fanned his face. Is anyone there? he said. He had purposely not raised his voice. There was no need to shout. Of course no one answered. Who could there have been to answer, since the caretaker was away? Now let him think it out. When he came in, he must have gone straight forward and then swerved slightly on the way back, therefore, no, he was getting confused. At that moment he heard the whistle of the train and felt reassured. The line from Wendover to Aylesbury ran half left from the front door, so it should be about there. He pointed with his finger, got up, groped his way forward, and found himself in a little narrow passage. Well, he must turn back and go to the right this time. He did so, and something seemed to slip just past him, and then he scratched his finger slightly on the brocade of the chair. Talk about a maze, he thought to himself, it's nothing to this. And then he said to himself under his breath, Curse this vile godforsaken place. A silly, panicky thing to do, he realised, almost as bad as shouting aloud. Well, it was obviously no use trying to find the door. He couldn't find it. He just couldn't. He'd sit in the chair till the light came. He sat down. How very silent it was. His hands began searching in his pockets once more, except for that sort of whispering sound over on the left somewhere. Except for that, it was absolutely silent. Except for that. What could it be? The caretaker was away. He turned his head slightly and listened intently. It was almost as if there were several people whispering together. One got curious sounds in old houses. How absurd it was. The chair couldn't be more than three or four yards away from the door. There was no doubt about that. It must be slightly to one side or the other. He tried the left once more. He got up, and something lightly brushed his face. Is anyone there? he said. And this time, he knew he had shouted. Who touched me? Who's whispering? Where's the door? What a nervous fool he was to shout like that. Yet someone outside might have heard him. He went groping forward again and touched the wall. He followed it along, touching it with his fingertips. And there was an opening. The door, the door, it must be. And he found himself going down a little narrow passage. He turned and ran back, and then he remembered he had put a matchbook in his note case. What a fool to have forgotten it, and made such an exhibition of himself. Yes, there it was, but his hands were trembling, and the booklet slipped through his fingers. He fell to his knees and began searching about on the floor. It must be just here. It can't be far. And then... Something icy cold and damp was pressed against his forehead. He flung himself forward to seize it, but there was nothing there. And then he leapt to his feet with tears streaming down his face, cried, Who is there? Save me! Save me! And then he began to run round and round, his arms outstretched. At last he stumbled against something, the chair, and something touched him.
as it slipped past. And then he ran screaming round the room, and suddenly his scream slashed back at him, for he was in a little narrow passage. Now, Mr. Runt, said the coroner, you say you heard screaming coming from the direction of the manor. Why didn't you go to find out what was the matter? None of us chaps goes to the manor after sundown, said Mr. Runt. Oh, I know there's some absurd superstitions about the house, but you haven't answered the question. There were screams, obviously coming from someone who wanted help. Why didn't you go to see what was the matter instead of running away? None of us chaps goes to the manor after sundown, said Mr. Runt. Don't fence with the question. Let me remind you that the doctor said Mr. Court must have had a seizure of some kind, but that had help been quickly forthcoming, his life might have been saved. Do you mean to tell me that even if you had known this, you would have still acted in so cowardly a way? Mr. Runt fixed his eyes on the ground and fingered his cap. None of us chaps goes to the manor after sundown. Blind Man's Buff by H.R. Wakefield, and that was recommended by a listener. So we're very open to suggestions of stories that have particularly affected you, freaked you out, or that you just like. So um, any any suggestions, welcome. I'm very happy to read those out. Actually, it depends what they are like. I'm not going to read out anything, just anything. H.R. Wakefield, Herbert Russell Wakefield, because in those days people liked to go by their initials rather than their names. So J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, all those people. Uh, M.R. James. I myself am J.A. Walker, but uh, I tend not to use the J.A. unless um, I'm making insurance claims. H.R. was born in 1888 in Sandgate, Kent, in England and died in 1964, so he lived quite a long time. He was the son of a man who became a clergyman, again, as a son of a clergyman. We've pointed this out before. This is a theme. Anyway, H.R.'s dad became Bishop of Birmingham, and uh, H.R. had a brother called Gilbert, who was a successful playwright in his time. H.R., the, the family, inevitably, if you become Bishop of Birmingham, you've got some bucks behind you. So... That may not be true these days, but certainly was in those days. And I don't know whether it was a lucrative thing to become Bishop of Birmingham. Maybe. Maybe it was the main chance. I don't know. Anyway, HR went to Marlborough College. Now, if you've ever been to Marlborough, it's a very lovely town in Wiltshire. And we stayed. We st I've been through there a couple of times, but we stayed there a couple of years ago, just outside the town. It was idyllic because the weather was nice as well. Uh, and then after he finished at um, Marlborough, he went to Oxford, where he studied history. His degree wasn't stellar, and it seems he spent a lot of time uh, playing sports rather than actually um, studying history, cricket, golf, hockey, and football. But he must have done some good, because after, after that he was secretary to the Viscount Northcliffe. When the war broke out in 1914, he joined the Royal Scots Fusiliers, and it's a funny thing, this, when you glean a few biographical facts of somebody from the internet, there are huge gaps there. So why, in particular, the Royal Scots Fusiliers? Did he have any Scottish connections? Um, it's, uh, it's just It may be available at, in, at somewhere, this information, but uh, I don't know it. And I think um, there are hints to all sorts of interesting biographies of people. That's why I quite like looking into the lives of the authors, because when you do, you just get hints ab about their personalities and their lives. And, of course, they were living people like us and had their ups and downs. They did, didn't just write stories. They lived lives as well and had loves and regrets. Yeah, why the Royal Scots Fusiliers? But he fought, we presume, bravely. He certainly stayed the course and was promoted to captain, which would hint that he was a brave man. And, in fact, he joined up in 1914 when it all started. For us, I know the Americans came a bit later, but uh, for us and, um, you know, the Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians, Indians, everybody else, it, it started in 1914. He was famous for his ghost stories, and he was successful, really. He was uh, secretary. He was in, in, the, in a publishing house. He became editor-in-chief of a publishing house. He married a rich American in the 20s, and 
she was of the Waldo family and they were very well off and they used to take a house in London for the season and we presume he met her there and um, they got divorced sadly. But again, I say this, um, maybe happily in 1936, maybe it was the best thing they ever did. She was from the, I think I said the Waldo families. His work, he wrote a lot of ghost stories. I think he produced seven collections and he was his, his reputation is spotted in that some people thought he was pretty good. What's his name? S.T. Joshi, he was a modern critic who does a lot of ca- um, collections of uh, modern horror stories and ghost stories. He's like a bit of an authority, a Lovecraft authority, but also he edited, I think, the um, book of American supernatural stories as well. He doesn't think much. He calls him mediocre. John Betjeman, who was an English poet, laureate, thought he was second rank to M.R. James, but that is still pretty good praise. M.R. James himself didn't think much of. Well, that's possibly unfair, but he wasn't glowing in his praise of Wakefield. August Derleth liked him. H.B. Lovecraft said he could write stories that rose to the greatest heights of horror. So, you know, a mixed bag. This story is about ostensibly fear of the dark. We guess there is a supernatural payoff in the end, in that he dies, he just doesn't die. We presume he just doesn't have a seizure because of his natural fear of the dark. We presume there's some kind of supernatural agency because uh, it's described to us as whispering and things like that. And we hear that the house is haunted and the stereotypical peasant man says, that was hard to read actually without sounding comic because Mr. Runt says, we don't go up, us fellas up here, we don't go up manner after dark and he just repeats it three times so it has the potential to be comic but um hopefully you didn't laugh because it you weren't i do do some things to make you laugh but that isn't one of them in a horror story it is a horror story because there's a bad end as well i often think that's a distinction a horror story has a bad outcome whereas a ghost story doesn't necessarily and that probably isn't a hard and fast rule but in terms of why does mr I've forgotten the name of the guy, the the protagonist. Why does he have to die? He's a bit arrogant, I think. That's his sin. If you remember, we talk about um, Blake Snyder's, who's a scriptwriter, idea. He has a this genre, the horror story genre. Um, he co- you know calls a monster in the house, and uh, there is a sin that invites the horror in. So I guess in this case. It is his arrogance and he's very um, disparaging about the, the yokel. And so he doesn't come across as a particularly nice guy. And perhaps we can then think, well, he deserves his fate. Wakefield, interestingly, strongly believed in the paranormal. He reported some ghost stories, um, not ghost stories, ghost experiences himself. The other thing I noted when I was going through it was... I don't know if you remember episode 13, which seems a long time ago now. Um, Margatina Lasky, who was a Polish, uh, an English writer of Polish descent, and she wrote a story called The Tower, which is a play on, it's a fear of the dark, but it's it's a fear of vertigo, uh, a fear of heights, you know, and uh, it's a single theme story set in Italy. You should go and listen to it. It's a very well thought of story, episode 13. I'll put a link in the show notes. So again, whereas this sounds like, feels like it's a fear of the dark, although the man does not have a phobia, we're not set up to believe he has a phobia of the dark. It's just mysterious in that he gets in and he just cannot get out. That in itself would be pretty horrible. You can't see where you're going. Your rational mind tells you that the door is just directly behind you, but something has skewed it in the dark. Anyway, there we go. So... I liked it. It was nice and short. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes we like a longer story, but hopefully we do both. Um, Thanks, everybody. Alex Boast has signed up as a Patreon. Um, A couple of patrons have actually increased their donation, their pledge, and that's fantastic, you know. Um, So if you felt you want, if you, I'm supposed to say it like this, the show is only made possible through the appreciation of its listeners. This is true. 
And so if you would like to show your appreciation, there are a number of ways you can do so. And I set them out in the show notes. But the, the, the big help to me is a Patreon pledge because that is like a consistent um, commitment. And it, it, it need only be a dollar a month. Obviously, Patreon take their cut. So it works out as about 60 cents. But if you felt that you liked what I'm doing, then that would be fantastically, greatly appreciated. It helps the... And funnily enough, I've been talking to people this week and it is possible to fully finance a show on Patreon. So if other people can do it, why can't we? Uh, People seem to appreciate the podcast. So, you know, if you're one of those people and you want to support it for a dollar a month. And the other side of it, of course, is that you get access to special things. I did the signal man. Now I was just talking to Alex, the latest Patreon, and I was suggesting that what I really want to do is Daphne du Maurier's Don't Look Now. I would love to do a volume of Venetian ghost stories. And I have found four, five potentially. And I would love to put them together. So we have Don't Look Now. And we have Salome's story, uh, which I'm possibly going to do. We have Ray Russell's Vendetta. And we have A Wicked Voice by Vernon Lee. And then we have Wilkie Collins's um, Haunted Hotel. Now, the Wil- Wilkie Collins's Woman in White is a fantastic story, but the Haunted Hotel is not so great, and that's a problem. But, you know, the idea of doing a Venetian, I, I kind of how I, I've gone into this tangent, I don't know. It's like what, what's called stream of consciousness, isn't it? You know, whatever's in my mind comes up my mouth. But that's one thing. What else do I need to say? You talked about Patreon. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Call to action. Crack on. Get onto Patreon. Support me. My book, London Horror Stories, is doing all right. I always can do a bit more love. I'm actually doing a lot of reading about writing at the moment. Oh, yeah, I've got to say, I started writing for Medium, and I did an article on time slips, because I'm kind of interested in, you know, paranormal, or else I wouldn't be doing this podcast. And it's got like 11,000. I I did some other previous articles and nobody much read them. And then this suddenly, boom, and I have no idea why. So it's an article article about um, time slips. So that's enthused me to crack on and write more Medium articles, which who knows if I can replicate the success of those. So anyway, lovely to read for you again. I have no clear idea what I'm going to do next week. I've got stuff going on real life and uh, that's causing some issues but hopefully by the time this goes out things will be sorted okay I, I will keep on as long as I can I will do, put out an episode a week and I will I, I would really love to do an episode a week for Patreons as well just add to the value as well that's my aim that's actually my ambition to do two episodes a week one for Patreons and one for the general podcast because the Patreons I just want to show how much I appreciate them okay I know I may be gone on about that a bit much but it's true all right there we are Thank you very much. You know, in September, it will be our first anniversary of the podcast as well. I can't remember what date the first episode went out, but um, it was sort of mid-September. So that's quite exciting. Managed to do an episode a week for a year. Some, around Christmas, we did more than an episode a week. So anyway, I'm hoping to do some stuff for Halloween as well. Okay, bye, 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 bye. I say so a lot and I go um a lot. You really notice these things when you edit your own speech. I advise you not to do that. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?